The Shunned House by H. P. Lovecraft Read by Morgan Scorpion The Shunned House, Part 1 From even the greatest of horrors, irony is seldom absent. Sometimes it enters directly into the composition of the events, while sometimes it relates only to their fortuitous position among persons and places. The latter sort is splendidly exemplified by a case in the ancient city of Providence, where in the late forties Edgar Allan Poe used to sojourn often during his unsuccessful wooing of the gifted poetess, Mrs. Whitman. Poe generally stopped at the mansion house in Benefit Street, the renamed Golden Ball Inn, whose roof has sheltered Washington, Jefferson, and Lafayette and his favourite walk led northward along the same street to Mrs. Whitman's home in the neighbouring hillside churchyard of St. John's, whose hidden expanse of eighteenth-century gravestones had for him a peculiar fascination. Now the irony is this. In this walk, so many times repeated, the world's greatest master of the terrible and the bizarre was obliged to pass a particular house on the eastern side of the street, a dingy, antiquated structure, perched on the abruptly rising side hill, with a great unkept yard, dating from a time when the region was partly open country. It does not appear that he ever wrote or spoke of it, nor is there any evidence that he even noticed it. And yet that house, to the two persons in possession of certain information, equals or outranks in horror the wildest fantasy of the genius who so often passed it unknowingly, and stands starkly leering as a symbol of all that is unutterably hideous. The house was, and for that matter still is, of a kind to attract the attention of the curious. Originally a farm or semi-farm building, it followed the average New England colonial lines of the middle eighteenth century, the prosperous peaked roof sort, with two stories and dormerless attic, and with the Georgian doorway and interior panelling dictated by the progress of taste at that time. It faced south, with one gable, and buried to the lower windows in the eastward rising hill, and the other exposed to the foundations towards the street. Its construction, over a century and a half ago, had followed the grading and straightening of the road in that especial vicinity, for Benefit Street, at first called Back Street, was laid out as a lane winding amongst the graveyards of the first settlers, and straightened only when the removal of the bodies to the north burial ground made it decently possible to cut through the old family plots. At the start, the western wall had lain some twenty feet up a precipitous lawn from the roadway, but a widening of the street at about the time of the revolution sheared off most of the intervening space, exposing the foundations, so that a brick basement wall had to be made, giving the deep cellar a street frontage with the door and two windows above ground, close to the new line of public travel. When the sidewalk was laid out a century ago, the last of the intervening space was removed, and Poe, in his walks, must have seen only a sheer ascent of dull grey brick flush with the sidewalk, and surmounted at a height of ten feet by the antique shingled bulk of the house proper. The farm-like grounds extended back very deeply up the hill, almost to Wheaton Street. The space south of the house, abutting on Benefit Street, was of course greatly above the existing sidewalk level, forming a terrace bounded by a high bank wall of damp mossy stone pierced by a steep flight of narrow steps, which led inwards between canyon-like surfaces to the upper region of Mangy Lawn, roomy brick walls, and neglected gardens whose dismantled cement urns, rusted kettles fallen from tripods of knotty sticks, and similar paraphernalia set off the weather-beaten front door with its broken fanlight, rotting ionic pilasters, and wormy triangular pediment. What I heard in my youth about the shunned house was merely that people died there in alarmingly great numbers. That, I was told, was why the original owners had moved out some twenty years after building the place. It was plainly unhealthy, perhaps because of the dampness and fungus growth in the cellar, the general sickish smell, the draughts of the hallways, or the quality of the well and pump water. These things were bad enough, and these were all that gained belief among the person whom I knew. Only the notebooks of my antiquarian uncle, Dr. Elihu Whipple, revealed to me at length the darker, vaguer surmises which formed an undercurrent of folklore among old-time servants and humble folk surmises which never travelled far, and which were largely forgotten when Providence grew to be a metropolis with a shifting modern population. The general fact is that the house was never regarded by the solid part of the community as in any real sense haunted. There were no widespread tales of rattling chains, cold currents of air, extinguished lights or faces at the window, 
extremists sometimes said the house was unlucky, but that is as far as even they went. Is that a frightful proportion of persons died there, or more accurately, had died there, since after some peculiar happenings over sixty years ago the building had become deserted through the sheer impossibility of renting it? These persons were not all cut off suddenly by any one cause. Rather did it seem that their vitality was insidiously sapped, so that each one died the sooner from whatever tendency to weakness he may have naturally had. And those who did not die displayed in varying degree a type of anemia or consumption, and sometimes a decline of the mental faculties, which spoke ill for the salubriousness of the building. Neighbouring houses, it must be added, seemed entirely free from the noxious quality. This much I knew before my insistent questioning led my uncle to show me the notes which finally embarked us both on our hideous investigation. In my childhood the shunned house was vacant, with barren, gnarled, and terrible old trees, long, queerly pale grass, and nightmarishly misshapen weeds in the high terraced yard where birds never lingered. We boys used to overrun the place, and I can still recall my youthful terror, not only at the morbid strangeness of this sinister vegetation, but at the eldritch atmosphere and odour of the dilapidated house, whose unlocked front door was often entered in quest of shudders. The small paned windows were largely unbroken, and a nameless air of desolation hung round the precarious panelling, shaky interior shutters, peeling wallpaper, falling plaster, rickety staircases, and such fragments of battered furniture as still remained. The dust and cobwebs added their touch of the fearful, and brave indeed was the boy who would voluntarily ascend the ladder to the attic, a vast, rafted length lighted only by small blinking windows in the gable ends, and filled with a massed wreckage of chests, chairs, and spinning wheels, which infinite years of deposit had shrouded and festooned into monstrous and hellish shapes. But after all, the attic was not the most terrible part of the house. It was the dank, humid cellar which somehow exerted the strongest repulsion on us, even though it was wholly above ground on the street side, with only a thin door and window-pierced brick wall to separate it from the busy sidewalk. We scarcely knew whether to haunt it in spectral fascination, or to shun it for the sake of our souls and our sanity. For one thing, the bad odour of the house was strongest there, and for another thing, we did not like the white fungus growths which occasionally sprang up in rainy summer weather from the hard earth floor. Those fungi, grotesquely like the vegetation in the yard outside, were truly horrible in their outlines, detestable parodies of toadstools and Indian pipes, whose like we had never seen in any other situation. They rotted quickly, and at one stage became slightly phosphorescent, so that nocturnal passers-by sometimes spoke of witch-fires glowing behind the broken panes of the fetus spreading windows. We never, even in our wildest Halloween moods, visited this cellar by night, but in some of our daytime visits could detect the phosphorescence, especially when the day was dark and wet. There was also a subtler thing we often thought we detected, a very strange thing which was, however, merely suggestive at most. I refer to a sort of cloudy whitish pattern on the dirt floor, a vague, shifting deposit of mould or nitre, which we sometimes thought we could trace amidst the sparse fungus growths near the huge fireplace of the basement kitchen. Once in a while it struck us that this patch bore an uncanny resemblance to a doubled-up human figure, though generally no such kinship existed, and often there was no whitish deposit whatever. On a certain rainy afternoon when this illusion seemed phenomenally strong, and when, in addition, I had fancied I glimpsed a kind of thin, yellowish, shimmering exhalation rising from the nitrous pattern toward the owning fireplace, I spoke to my uncle about the matter. He smiled at this odd conceit but it seemed that his smile was tinged with reminiscence. Later I heard that a similar notion entered into some of the wild ancient tales of the common folk, a notion likewise alluding to ghoulish, wolfish shapes taken by smoke from the great chimney, and queer contours assumed by certain of the sinuous tree-roots that thrust their way into the cellar through the loose foundation stones. Part 2 not till my adult years did my uncle set before me the notes and data which he had collected concerning the shunned house. Dr. Whipple was a sane, conservative physician of the old school, and for all his interest in the place was not eager to encourage young thoughts toward the abnormal. His own view, postulating simply a building and location of markedly unsanitary qualities, had nothing to do with abnormality, 
but he realized that the very picturesqueness which aroused his own interest would in a boy's fanciful mind take on all manner of gruesome imaginative associations the doctor was a bachelor a white-haired clean-shaven old-fashioned gentleman and a local historian of note who had often broken the lance with such controversial guardians of tradition as sidney s ryder and thomas w bicknell he lived with one manservant in a georgian homestead with knocker and iron rail steps balanced eerily on the steep ascent of north court street beside the ancient brick court and colony house where his grandfather a cousin of that celebrated privateersman captain ripple who burnt his majesty's armed schooner gaspy in seventeen seventy two had voted in the legislature on may the fourth seventeen seventy six for the independence of the rhode island colony around him in the damp low-ceiled library with the musty white panelling heavy carved overmantel and small paned vine-shaded windows were the relics and records of his ancient family among which were many dubious allusions to the shunned house in benefit street that pest spot lies not far distant for benefit runs ledgewise just above the court-house along the precipitous hill up which the first settlement climbed when in the end my insistent pestering and maturing years evoked from my uncle the hoarded law i sought there lay before me a strange enough chronicle long-winded statistical and drearily genealogical as some of the matter was there ran through it a continuous thread of brooding tenacious horror and preternatural malevolence which impressed me even more than it had impressed the good doctor separate events fitted together uncannily and seemingly irrelevant details held minds of hideous possibilities a new and burning curiosity grew in me compared to which my boyish curiosity was feeble and inchoate the first revelation led to an exhaustive research and finally to that shuddering quest which proved so disastrous to myself and mine for at last my uncle insisted on joining the search which i had commenced and after a certain night in that house he did not come away with me i am lonely without that gentle soul whose long years were filled only with honour virtue good taste benevolence and learning i have reared a marble urn to his memory in st john's churchyard the place that poe loved the hidden grove of giant willows on the hill where tombs and headstones huddle quietly between the hoary bulk of the church and the houses and bank walls of benefit street the history of the house opening amidst a maze of dates revealed no trace of the sinister either about its construction or about the prosperous and honourable family who built it yet from the first a taint of calamity soon increased to boding significance was apparent my uncle's carefully compiled record began with the building of the structure in seventeen sixty three and followed the theme with an unusual amount of detail the shunned house it seems was first inhabited by William Harris and his wife, Roby Dexter, with their children, Elkanah, born in 1755, Abigail, born in 1757, William Jr., born in 1759, and Ruth, born in 1761. Harris was a substantial merchant and seaman in the West India trade, connected with the firm of Obadiah Brown and his nephews. After Brown's death, in 1761, the new firm of Nicholas Brown & Co. made him master of the brig Prudence, Providence-built, of a hundred and twenty tons, thus enabling him to erect the new homestead he had desired ever since his marriage. The site he had chosen, a recently straightened part of the new and fashionable back street, which ran along the side of the hill above crowded Cheapside, was all that could be wished, and the building did justice to the location. It was the best that moderate means could afford and Harris hastened to move in before the birth of a fifth child which the family expected. That child, a boy, came in December, but was still born. Nor was any child to be born alive in that house for a century and a half. The next April sickness occurred among the children, and Abigail and Ruth died before the month was over. Dr. Job Ives diagnosed a trouble of some infantile fever, though others declared it was more of a mere wasting away or decline. It seemed, in any event, to be contagious, for Anna Bowen, one of the two servants, died of it in the following June. Eli Lydiason, the other servant, constantly complained of weakness, and would have returned to his father's farm in Rehoboth, but for a sudden attachment for Mehitabel Pierce, who was hired to succeed Hannah. He died the next year, a sad year indeed, since it marked the death of William Harris himself, enfeebled as he was by the climate of Martinique, 
where his occupation had kept him for considerable periods during the preceding decade. The widowed Roby Harris never recovered from the shock of her husband's death, and the passing of her first-born Elkanah two years later was the final blow to her reason. In 1768 she fell victim to a mild form of insanity, and was thereafter confined to the upper part of the house, her elder maiden sister Mercy Dexter having moved in to take charge of the family. Mercy was a plain, raw-boned woman of great strength, but her health visibly declined from the time of her advent. She was greatly devoted to her unfortunate sister, and had an especial affection for her only surviving nephew William, who from a sturdy infant had become a sickly, spindling lad. In this year the servant Mehitable died, and the other servant, Preserved Smith, left without coherent explanation, or at least with only some wild tales and a complaint that he disliked the smell of the place. For a time Mercy Dexter could secure no more help, since the seven deaths and case of madness, all occurring within five years' space, had begun to set in motion the body of fireside rumour which had later became so bizarre. Ultimately, however, she obtained new servants from out of town. Anne White, a morose woman from that part of North Kingston, now set off as the township of Exeter, and a capable Boston man named Zenas Lowe. It was Anne White who first gave definite shape to the sinister idle talk. Mercy should have known better than to hire anyone from the Noose Neck Hill country, for that remote bit of backwoods was then, as now, a seat of the most uncomfortable superstitions. As lately as 1892 an Exeter community exhumed a dead body and ceremoniously burnt its heart in order to prevent certain alleged visitations injurious to the public health and peace, and one may imagine the point of view of the same section in 1768. Anne's tongue was perniciously active, and within a few months Mercy discharged her, filling her place with the faithful and amiable Amazon from Newport, Maria Robbins. Meanwhile, poor Roby Harris, in her madness, gave voice to dreams and imaginings of the most hideous sort. At times her screams became insupportable, and for long periods she would utter shrieking horrors which necessitated her son's temporary residence with his cousin, Peleg Harris, in Presbyterian Lane near the new college building. The boy would seem to improve after these visits, and had Mercy been as wise as she was well-meaning, she would have let him live permanently with Peleg. Just what Mrs. Harris cried out in her fits of violence, tradition hesitates to say, or rather present such extravagant accounts that they nullify themselves through sheer absurdity. Certainly it sounds absurd to hear that a woman educated only in the rudiments of French often shouted for hours in a coarse and idiomatic form of that language, or that the same person, alone and guarded, complained wildly of a staring thing which bit and chewed at her. In 1772 the servant Zenas died, and when Mrs. Harris heard of it she laughed with a shocking delight utterly foreign to her. The next year she herself died, and was laid to rest in the North Burial Ground beside her husband. Upon the outbreak of trouble with Great Britain in 1775, William Harris, despite his scant sixteen years and feeble constitution, managed to enlist in the Army of Observation under General Green, and from that time on enjoyed a steady rise in health and prestige. In 1780, as a captain in Rhode Island forces in New Jersey, under Colonel Angle, he met and married Phoebe Hetfield of Elizabethtown, whom he brought to Providence upon his honourable discharge in the following year. The young soldier's return was not a thing of unmitigated happiness. The house, it is true, was still in good condition, and the street had been widened and changed its name from Back Street to Benefit Street. But Mercy Dexter's once robust frame had undergone a sag and curious decay, so that she was now a stooped and pathetic figure with hollow voice and disconcerting pallor, qualities shared to a singular degree by the one remaining servant, Maria. In the autumn of 1782, Phoebe Harris gave birth to a stillborn daughter, and on the 15th of the next May, Mercy Dexter took leave of a useful, austere, and virtuous life. William Harris, at last thoroughly convinced of the radically unhealthful nature of his abode, now took steps toward quitting it and closing it forever. Securing temporary quarters for himself and wife at the newly opened Golden Ball Inn, he arranged for the building of a new and finer house in Westminster Street, in the growing part of the town across the Great Bridge. There, in 1785, his son Duty was born, 
and there the family dwelt till the encroachments of commerce drove them back across the river and over the hill to Angle Street, in the newer East Side Residence District, where the late Archer Harris built his sumptuous but hideous French-roofed mansion in 1876. William and Phoebe both succumbed to the yellow fever epidemic in 1797, but duty was brought up by his cousin Rathbone Harris, Peleg's son. Rathbone was a practical man, and rented the Benefit Street house despite William's wish to keep it vacant. He considered it an obligation to his ward to make the most of all the boy's property, nor did he concern himself with the deaths and illnesses which caused so many changes of tenants, or the steadily growing aversion with which the house was generally regarded. It is likely that he felt only vexation when, in 1804, the town council ordered him to fumigate the place with sulphur, tar, and gum camphor on account of the much discussed death of four persons, presumably caused by the then diminishing fever epidemic. They said the place had a febrile smell. Duty himself thought little of the house, for he grew up to be a privateersman, and served with distinction on the vigilant under Captain Calhoun in the war of 1812. He returned unharmed, married in 1814, and became a father on that memorable night of September 23, 1815, when a great gale drove the waters of the bay over half the town, and floated a tall sloop well up Westminster Street, so that its masts almost tapped the house windows in symbolic affirmation that the new boy, Welcome, was a seaman's son. Welcome did not survive his father, but lived to perish gloriously at Fredericksburg in 1862. Neither he nor his son Archer knew of the shunned house as other than a nuisance almost impossible to rent, perhaps on account of the mustiness and sickly odour of unkempt old age. Indeed, it never was rented after a series of deaths culminating in 1861, which the excitement of the war tended to throw into obscurity. Carrington Harris, last of the male line, knew it only as a deserted and somewhat picturesque centre of legend, until I told him my experience. He had meant to tear it down and build an apartment house on the site, but after my account, decided to let it stand, install plumbing, and rent it. Nor has he yet had any difficulty in obtaining tenants. The horror has gone. Part 3 It may well be imagined how powerfully I was affected by the annals of the Harrises. In this continuous record there seemed to me to brood a persistent evil beyond anything in nature as I had known it an evil clearly connected with the house and not with the family. This impression was confirmed by my uncle's less systematic array of miscellaneous data. Legends transcribed from servant gossip, cuttings from the papers, copies of death certificates by fellow physicians and the like. All of this material I cannot hope to give, for my uncle was a tireless antiquarian and very deeply interested in the shunned house but I may refer to several dominant points which are noticed by their recurrence through many reports from diverse sources. For example, the servant gossip was practically unanimous in attributing to the fungus and malodorous cellar of the house a vast supremacy in evil influence. There had been servants, Anne White especially, who would not use the cellar kitchen, and at least three well-defined legends bore upon the queer quasi-human or diabolic outlines assumed by tree roots and patches of mould in that region. These latter narratives interested me profoundly, on account of what I had seen in my boyhood. But I felt that most of the significance had in each case been largely obscured by additions from the common stock of local ghost lore. Anne White, with her Exeter superstition, had promulgated the most extravagant and at the same time most consistent tale, alleging that there must lie buried beneath the house one of those vampires, the dead who retain their bodily form and live on the blood or breath of the living whose hideous legions send their prey in shapes or spirits abroad by night. To destroy a vampire one must, the grandmothers say, exhume it and burn its heart, or at least drive a stake through the art organ, and Anne's dogged insistence on a search under the cellar had been prominent in bringing about her discharge. Her tales, however, commanded a wide audience, and were the more readily accepted because the house indeed stood on a land once used for burial purposes. To me their interest depended less on this circumstance than on the peculiarly appropriate way in which they dovetailed with certain other things. The complaint of the departing servant preserved Smith, 
who had preceded Anne and never heard of her, that something sucked his breath at night. The death certificates of fever victims in 1804, issued by Dr. Chad Hopkins, and showing the four deceased persons all unaccountably lacking in blood, and the obscure passages of poor Roby Harris's ravings, where she complained of the sharp teeth of a glassy-eyed, half-visible presence. Free from unwarranted superstition though I am, these things produced in me an odd sensation, which was intensified by a pair of widely separated newspaper cuttings relating to deaths in the shunned house. One from the Providence Gazette and Country Journal of April the 12th, 1815, and the other from the Daily Transcript and Chronicle of October the 27th, 1845, each of which detailed an appallingly grisly circumstance whose duplication was remarkable. It seems that in both instances the dying person, in 1815 a gentle old lady named Stafford, and in 1845 a schoolteacher of middle age named Eliazar Durfee, became transfigured in a horrible way, glaring glassily and attempting to bite the throat of the attending physician. Even more puzzling, though, was the final case which put an end to the renting of the house, a series of anemia deaths preceded by progressive madnesses wherein the patient would craftily attempt the lives of his relatives by incisions in the neck or wrists. This was in 1860 and 1861, when my uncle had just begun his medical practice, and before leaving for the front he heard much of it from his elder professional colleagues. The really inexplicable thing was the way in which the victims, ignorant people, for the ill-smelling and widely shunned house could now be rented to no others, would babble maledictions in French a language they could not possibly have studied to any extent. It made one think of poor Roby Harris nearly a century before, and so moved my uncle that he commenced collecting historical data on the house after listening, some time subsequent to his return from the war, to the first-hand account of Doctors Chase and Whitmarsh. Indeed, I could see that my uncle had thought deeply on the subject, and that he was glad of my own interest an open-minded and sympathetic interest which enabled him to discuss with me matters at which others would merely have laughed. His fancy had not gone so far as mine, but he felt that the place was rare in its imaginative potentialities, and worthy of note as an inspiration in the field of the grotesque and the macabre. For my part, I was disposed to take the whole subject with profound seriousness, and began at once not only to review the evidence, but to accumulate as much as I could. I talked with the elderly Archer Harris, then owner of the house, many times before his death in 1916, and obtained from him and his still surviving maiden sister Alice an authentic corroboration of all the family data my uncle had collected. When, however, I asked them what connection with France or its language the house could have, they confessed themselves as frankly baffled and ignorant as I. Archer knew nothing, and all that Miss Harris could say was that an old allusion her grandfather, Duty Harris, had heard of, might have shed a little light. The old seaman, who had survived his son Welcome's death in battle by two years, had not himself known the legend, but recalled that his earliest nurse, the ancient Maria Robbins, seemed darkly aware of something that might have lent a weird significance to the French ravings of Roby Harris, which she had so often heard during the last days of that hapless woman. Maria had been at the shunned house from 1769 till the removal of the family in 1783, and had seen Mercy Dexter die. Once she hinted to the child duty of a somewhat peculiar circumstance in Mercy's last moments, but he had soon forgotten all about it, save that it was something peculiar. The granddaughter, moreover, recalled even this much with difficulty. She and her brother were not so much interested in the house as was Archer's son Carrington, the present owner, with whom I talked after my experience. Having exhausted the Harris family of all the information it could furnish, I turned my attention to early town records and deeds, with a zeal more penetrating than that which my uncle had occasionally shown in the same work. What I wished was a comprehensive history of the site from its very settlement in 1636, or even before, if any Narragansett Indian legend could be unearthed to supply the data. I found at the start that the land had been part of a long strip of the lot granted originally to John Throckmorton, one of many similar strips beginning at the town street beside the river and extending up over the hill to a line roughly corresponding with the modern Hope Street. The Throckmorton lot had later, of course, been much subdivided, and I became very assiduous in tracing that section through which Back or Benefit Street was later run. It had, a rumour indeed said, been the Throckmorton graveyard, but as I examined the records more carefully, 
I found that the graves had all been transferred at an early date to the north burial ground on the Portucket West Road. Then suddenly I came, by a rare piece of chance, since it was not in the main body of records and might easily have been missed, upon something which aroused my keenest eagerness, filling in as it did with several of the queerest phases of the affair. It was the record of a lease in 1697 of a small tract of ground to an Etienne Roulet and his wife. At last the French element had appeared. That, and another deeper element of horror which the name conjured up from the darkest recesses of my weird and heterogeneous reading. And I feverishly studied the plotting of the locality as it had been before the cutting through and partial straightening of Back Street between 1747 and 1758. I found what I had half expected, that where the shunned house now stood, the Roulets had laid out their graveyard behind a one-story and attic cottage and that no record of any transfer of graves existed. The document, indeed, ended in much confusion, and I was forced to ransack both the Rhode Island Historical Society and Shepley Library before I could find a local door which the name of Etienne Roulet would unlock. In the end I did find something, something of such vague but monstrous import that I set about at once to examine the cellar of the shunned house itself with a new and excited minuteness. The Roulets, it seemed, had come in 1696 from East Greenwich, down the west shore of Narragansett Bay. They were Huguenots from Code, and had encountered much opposition before the Providence selectmen allowed them to settle in the town. Unpopularity had dogged them in East Greenwich, whither they had come in 1686, after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and rumour said that the cause of dislike extended beyond mere racial and national prejudice, or the land disputes which involved other French settlers with the English in rivalries, which not even Governor Andros could quell. But their ardent Protestantism, too ardent, some whispered, and their evident distress when virtually driven from the village had been granted a haven. And the swarthy Etienne Roulet, less apt at agriculture than at reading queer books and drawing queer diagrams, was given a clerical post in the warehouse at Pardon Tillingast War, far south in Town Street. There had, however, been a riot of some sort later on, perhaps forty years later after old Roulet's death, and no one seemed to hear of the family after that. For a century and more, it appeared, the Roulets had been well remembered and frequently discussed as vivid incidents in the quiet life of a New England seaport. Etienne's son Paul, a surly fellow whose erratic conduct had probably provoked the riot which wiped out the family, was a particularly a source of speculation. And though Providence never shared the witchcraft panics of her Puritan neighbours, it was freely intimated by old wives that his prayers were neither uttered at the proper time nor directed toward the proper object. All this had undoubtedly formed the basis of the legend known by old Maria Robbins. What relation it had to the French ravings of Roby Harris and other inhabitants of the shunned house, imagination or future discovery alone could determine. I wondered... How many of those who had known the legends realised that additional link with the terrible which my wider reading had given me? That ominous item in the annals of morbid horror which tells of the creature, Jacques Roulet of Code, who in 1598 was condemned to death as a demoniac, but afterwards saved from the stake by the Paris Parliament and shut in a madhouse. He had been found covered with blood and shreds of flesh in a wood, shortly after the killing and rending of a boy by a pair of wolves one wolf was seen to lope away unhurt. Surely a pretty hearthside tale, with a queer significance as to name and place. But I decided that the Providence gossips could not have generally known of it. Had they known, the coincidence of names would have brought some drastic and frightened action. Indeed, might not its limited whispering have precipitated the final riot which erased the rulers from the town? I now visited the accursed place with increased frequency, studying the unwholesome vegetation of the garden, examining all the walls of the building, and poring over every inch of the earth and cellar floor. Finally, with Carrington Harris's permission, I fitted a key to the disused door opening from the cellar directly upon Benefit Street, preferring to have a more immediate access to the outside world than the dark stairs, ground floor hall, and front door could give. There, where morbidity lurked most thickly, I searched and poked during long afternoons when the sunlight filtered in through the cobwebbed above-ground door, which placed me only a few feet from the placid sidewalk outside. Nothing new rewarded my efforts. 
only the same depressing mustiness and faint suggestion of noxious odours and nitrous outlines on the floor, and I fancy that many pedestrians must have watched me curiously through the broken panes. At length, upon a suggestion of my uncle's, I decided to try the spot nocturnally, and one stormy midnight ran the beams of an electric torch over the mouldy floor with its uncanny shapes, and distorted half-phosphorescent fungi. The place had dispirited me curiously that evening, and I was almost prepared when I saw, or thought I saw, amid the whitish deposits a particularly sharp definition of the huddled form I had suspected from boyhood. Its clearness was astonishing and unprecedented, and as I watched, I seemed to see again the thin, yellowish, shimmering exhalation which had startled me on that rainy afternoon so many years before. Above the anthropomorphic patch of mould by the fireplace it rose, a subtle, sickish, almost luminous vapour, which, as it hung trembling in the dampness, seemed to develop vague and shocking suggestions of form, gradually trailing off into nebulous decay and passing up into the blackness of the great chimney, with a feta in its wake. It was truly horrible, and the more so to me because of what I knew of the spot. Refusing to flee, I watched it fade, and as I watched I felt that it was in turn watching me greedily with eyes more imaginable than visible. When I told my uncle about it he was greatly aroused, and after a tense hour of reflection arrived at a definite and drastic decision. Weighing in his mind the importance of the matter, and the significance of our relation to it, he insisted that we both test, and if possible destroy, the horror of the house by a joint night or nights of aggressive vigil in that musty and fungus-cursed cellar. End of the first half of The Shunned House by H. P. Lovecraft Read by Morgan Scorpion